So Nicolina and I are here with a few ISD members, Dr. Angel Morgan and Victor Lee Lewis. We want to invite you to a wonderful benefit for IASD diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. On October 19th, there's an online screening for the 30th anniversary of the acclaimed documentary film, The Color of Fear. Today, we'll be discussing the importance of the benefit and also just sharing with you some amazing programs put together by the IASD Diversity Advisory Committee. So definitely check that out. We will put all the information. Um, I love ISD's commitment to diversifying the field of dream research, amplifying underrepresented voices. I think that's really important. So welcome, Dr. Morgan and Victor. Please, I'd love for you to introduce yourselves, maybe give me a few words about how you got into dream work and why this is important to you. Sure. Well, oh my goodness. Well, I'm really excited to be here today supporting uh, Victor's screening and this benefit for the ISD uh, DAC programs, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Well, how did I get involved with this particular um, event is that I am the chair of the Diversity Advisory Committee, which started as the Diversity Task Force Advisory Committee in 2020 when I was president of ISD. So I was president from 2019 to 2021. And in that time, ISD um, made a pledge under my presidency to grow an intentional inclusive process for Black, Indigenous, and people of color with expert expertise or interest in dreams and to expand the ethnic diversity of ISD, um, to increase the ethnic diversity of in invited speakers at future conferences, mm -hmm. and also to support our programs, which we put into place in mm, from 2021 2020 to 2021, we put together about nine programs. We we worked so hard and how that committee formed, I reached out and invited specific people in the ISD community and we formed the DAC and Victor Lee Lewis was one of them, very important um, contributor to that. And so our programs that we created, um, the, the ones that require funding we have DEI Dream Research Grants. We have DEI Student Dream Research Awards. So there's a $500 DEI award for student research every year. BIPOC Conference Scholarships, which is incredibly successful. And our Culture Keeper memberships. So all of that you can read about on the ISD website in the Dreams and Ethnicity portal. And you can also see photographs and bios of all the wonderful DAC members who I am so honored and blessed to work with. Well, what really excites me about what I just heard in the uh, work of IASD around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and especially uh, uh, Dr. Angel Morgan's uh, work around this issue is the omnidirectional quality of it, that it's not just top down, we'll do some little something for the, the management. It's not just, well, we'll get a, a, a little diversity uh, um, in the conference by either having a keynote or a breakout or, or getting some rank and file participants uh, of difference to uh, at, attend, but actually uh, ISD's uh, approach is multi-directional. I want to say omnidirectional because I think if we discover new directions, we're going to take those too. But not assuming that it's just one thing. So uh, I, I want to comment very briefly about the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion work of IASD and then go way back in the way back machine to how I uh, got my interest in uh, dream work and then how that led me to IASD. It's a true story, very interesting. Um, as a teenager, I read a book called Modern Man in Search of a Soul. And this is a book by Carl Jung where he's reflecting toward the end of his life on the implications of archetypal and analytic psychology for the transformation of society. And as a um, a teenage social activist involved in the uh, Black Freedom Movement, the uh, anti-war movement, and uh, Vietnam. I'm old. Uh, and the um, uh, budding um, environmental movement, 
and eventually the uh, uh, Central American Solidarity Movement, I was very, very interested both in spirituality and in social transformation. And in, in the work of Carl Jung, I found um, this effort at um, uh, wrestling with the depths of the soul and how that is reflected collectively and writ large in these structures of society. And I thought there's something to this, but I'm not quite buying it yet. He, he hasn't really embraced um, Marx. He hasn't really embraced critical theory. He hasn't really embraced a critique of capitalism or patriarchy or white supremacy or imperialism. So uh, it's kind of cringy. And uh, uh, fast forward, I'm, I moved from Cleveland, Ohio to uh, uh, Berkeley, California in my early 20s and um, joined a, um, a, a mental health uh, services organization called St. George Homes. Uh, and they were centered around the work of uh, uh, C.G. Jung and used uh, dream work and expressive arts therapy to uh, treat and arguably heal severely emotionally disturbed uh, teenagers and adolescents. And we're talking about schizophrenia, among other uh, very uh, uh, serious uh, mental health problems. And uh, I was a trainee there, and we got invited to do a, uh, an in-service, actually it was a required uh, in-service training, and a man named Jeremy Taylor came into the in-service, and he was going to do a dream group with us. And I'm like, Pfft whatever right and uh we sat in the dream group for about um i want to say maybe a half an hour and by the end of that half an hour in which very interesting things happen i was like i don't know what your plans were but you're gonna be my freaking teacher because i am not letting you out of my sight until i get everything that you got going on about dreams inside of me so uh, with that silent declaration, I started following him around and uh, I followed him very, very closely for about uh, seven years. And it so happened that Jeremy Taylor was uh, one of the co-founders of IASD. And then fast forward, I think um, maybe 2020, I'm doing uh, a series of um, uh, conversations called hard conversations, which are uh, conversations about ra racism. I guess you could call it anti-racism work, although I would uh, say that it's uh, a work about uh, uh, healing white supremacy within the human family and uh, uh, bringing us all into harmony, equity, and one accord. And were you were you in one of those groups? So uh, uh, Andrew apparently was in one of the groups, and the way I'm remembering it is uh, she said, oh, might you be interested in doing a workshop for IASD? And I went, IASD, blah, 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 blah. Jeremy Taylor, it changed my life. And I did my senior thesis on dreams and I did my master's thesis on dreams. And Jeremy was my thesis advisor and blah, blah, blah. I would love to do that because I've been doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work for a very long time, most of my adult life. But um, a parallel passion was the spirituality, the life of the unconscious, and dreams, and my uh, probably most significant um, adult mentor, and my first was uh, the, a co-founder of the organization, so I'm like, this was meant to be, this is definitely meant to be. And fast forward again, um, the, the dream work and the uh, work for uh, equity, social justice, and uh, healing the human relationship uh, with other members of the Earth community uh, uh, brings us to the 30th anniversary of the Color of Fear. That's amazing. Um, before uh, people start wondering, you do trainings for ISD. Amina and me were lucky to follow some and just to give a little tiny bit of your wisdom to us youngsters who tried to get the word out there. Um, I would love it if we could just take one breath and tell everyone who hasn't heard of it yet, like what 
what else does the ISD diversity equity and inclusion program do we 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 got trainings for the for the members themselves very practically we talked about the grants it is easy to assume that diversity equity and inclusion work is the work of a special interest group on behalf of uh, people who've had a rough time and uh, that conception um, bothers me enormously, not just because it's kind of insulting, but it's also profoundly false. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work, when it is um, uh, at its best, is obviously intrinsically a blessing for everybody. It's not about uh, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. We're flipping the script and, you know, you got to be on top before and now you get to, you know, clean the latrines. Uh, no. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion means that we bring the best uh, of every soul, every body forward into a cohesive, collaborative, um, and um, regenerative process. And, but the big frame for this is human liberation. Uh, and human liberation is both the uh, uh, undoing of the effects and the elimination of the causes of every form of human alienation, violence, and oppression. And that includes internalized violence, uh, alienation, uh, and oppression. And dream work and diversity, equity, and inclusion work are both marginalized in, the, in our current society, um, held with some suspicion. I've held uh, dream work with suspicion because I thought it was navel gazing as opposed to a wellspring of uh, creativity coming from the heart of the world into our personal and uh, collective uh, hearts in service to uh, what the life journey is really all about. So I think when we're doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work, and when we're doing um, the uh, uh, dream work, we're doing the work of life itself. Neither one of them uh, is one bit less than central to the human prospect, but both have been uh, marginalized with, in a hyper-rationalist, white supremacist, capitalist, anthropocentric society. And, uh, and the answers come from our dreams and it comes from the, the margins of society. Amen. <laughs> yes, very well said. First, before we shift into talking about the film a little bit, um, maybe what are some goals for the upcoming conferences and um, some things that you know the committee is looking to work on in the future? Wonderful question. I can address that. Um, so in 2025, we are doing an all virtual annual um, conference. So when that happens, and the only time we've ever done that before was in 2021. And what we learned when we did that is we opened it up to so many more people, so many more people could come. So we love having our annual conferences in person, but at the same time, having an occasional virtual one really helps be more inclusive. And we, let's see, we have a dreams and ethnicity track, which also was brand new um, from the DAC, from since the forming of the DAC, ISD never had a dreams and ethnicity track. So that uh, is a beautiful um, addition. And you can read about that if you're interested. Again, on the dreams and ethnicity portal, there's a full paragraph describing what that means to be submitting a presentation or attending events or um, artistic presentations or workshops or panels in the dreams and ethnicity track. So again, that was a creative collaboration from the DAC. So that's really exciting. Also, um, by, we have BIPOC conference scholarships. So uh, you can contact the DAC to ask for an application for that. All of that information is on the portal in the ISD website. And we have regional conferences next year because we're doing the annual online. We are going to have one in particular 
um, hosted by one of our DAC members, uh, Dr. Fanny Brewster, who has done incredible work um, in the field of depth psychology um, and diversity and beyond. She's just such a, we're such a heart-centered group and we're really you know, infusing that heart-centeredness into the culture of ISD and Fanny Brewster, Dr. Fanny Brewster is so good at that. So she and Dr. Stephanie Burns will be co-hosting a regional in New Orleans um, at you know later in 2025. So that's something that the DAC is supporting. But anyway, we as far as what you can do to help these programs, all the programs I mentioned before, the research, the student awards, the BIPOC conference scholarships, the uh, culture keeper memberships, getting more uh, speakers. All of that, it, it requires funding. And so the way you can help is by, well, for one, participating. You know, if you need a BIPOC conference scholarship to attend, please contact us and get involved. Volunteering is another way you can get involved. But because we do need the funding to keep the programs alive, any amount of a donation is so appreciated. The smallest amount to the largest amount just whatever you can afford, whatever you feel comfortable with, that's that's really the way you can support. Yeah, I'd love to add as well is, um, first of all, donating can uh, all year, but we're having this uh, on, on the 19th, this amazing viewing where everybody's welcome. We'll talk about the movie, we promise. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's just, it's also really fun to be part of this movement. I, I, I've, I've found the energy that you guys bring is amazing. And even if you're sitting at home now and thinking, yeah, okay, but I don't have money, doesn't mean you can't help. Even sharing this video means that people are aware of the work that's happening. Even liking a post means that people will come to the viewing and at least see this amazing movie that you get to watch for free. So giving it back to you, Amina, because we need to talk about this. Definitely, <laughs> yes. Good point, yes. Sharing goes a long way. But I am really excited for the screening um, and it will be facilitated by Victor who was prominently featured in the film. So I'd love to know about your intention going into the filming and what your experience was like. Well, we sat down um, 31 years ago. The film came out uh, exactly 30 years ago, a couple months. Um, and I had seen a lot of didactic films with statistics and pie charts, uh, poverty statistics, discrimination statistics, or first person testimonies uh, about, um, you know, the ways that people have been uh, oppressed and marginalized. And I thought, that is no longer particularly interesting to me. And it's not persuasive to the people who aren't already convinced. I want to see a couple of things that I've never seen before. And if I don't see them, I'm going to bring them. One, I want to have a conversation that brings to life the uh, visceral reality behind the statistics and the pie charts, that uh, those statistics are indicative of the uh, uh, suffering impacts of uh, uh, pain and death on human bodies. And I wanted to not have it be an academic conversation, but a conversation about uh, uh, people contending with the ultimate questions of life, death, and belonging. Safety, dignity, other issues, but especially life, death, and belonging. And like, damn it, you know, this is important. So I wanted to have a non-didactic, non-academic, uh, buttoned up, conversation, but one that is as raw and real as racism itself. And if nobody else is going to do it, I'm going to do it. And so I did. Uh, the other thing that really bugged me is like, and I found this puzzling. I'm like, this is a mystery. You ask uh, an Asian person, what does it mean to be Asian? And they're going to tell you something. You ask a Native American person, indigenous person, what does it mean to be indigenous? They're going to tell you something. You ask a black person, what does it mean to be black? They're going to tell you something. Latino, Latinx, they're going to tell you something. Uh, you ask a white person, what does it mean to be white? This was in 1993, mind you. And they're like, oh? 
It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and I thought, aha, that is some shadowy material hidden in plain sight. What do you mean that whiteness doesn't mean anything? Or that you don't know what it means, that it just means to be normal or whatever that is. And I thought, why don't we interrogate whiteness beyond the first question and the first dismissal, which usually ends the conversation? And I thought, no, I really, really want to know what the white experience is, because I have a human experience as well as a black experience. They're not separate, they're overlapping. And you think that your white experience and your human experience is the same freaking thing, and it's not. And I want to kind of get a, so I was, I, that was my hypothesis. And then, so I started pushing and nudging to get underneath that. And, and it all got very interesting. Uh, in, the, in the weekend retreat that we did, it got interesting after about three hours of, uh, you know. <laughs> I don't know what we were doing, debating or something, testimony and rebuttal, cross-examination. Uh, and eventually the bottom opened up. And I would say that this was a moment of grace which swept up every person in the room, including the, uh, the camera people and the sound guy, that we started having a heartfelt, authentic, soulful conversation about race that was rooted in our experience rather than in ideology. And what did we find from that? That a, an opportunity for profound, life-changing transformation was made available every time we showed that film to a group. I mean, I, you know, and because it's been around for 30 years, that means that 10 years ago, I met uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion officers, um, vice provosts for this and that and the other thing, uh, doctors of this and that who are doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work in the academic environment. And they say, when I was an undergraduate, I saw this film and I knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I've heard that 20 times maybe. Uh, and there are many other occasions, I imagine, where I could have heard that. So the color of fears had an impact based upon, I believe, it's opening up into Kairos time, opening up into ritual time, opening up into uh, dream time. It was not like uh, a political argument or even an argument about race. It was much, much more like the um, uh, transformative narratives uh, that happen in myth and dreams. Um, there was the, the leaving, uh, the leave taking, <laughs> you know, there's the getting lost in the, uh, in the woods. There was um, moments of despair, emptiness, or what one might call the dark night of the soul. All of the basic turns in the um, in what we could call a collaborative, uh, interactive uh, uh, hero's journey uh, were present. And we had to go from an initial starting point of profound polarization uh, to profound harmony and solidarity that didn't exclude anything or sweep anything under the rug. And that's important because where we started was our, uh, at least one of our white brothers was trying to sweep things under the rug. And the other white brother was trying to sweep the more clueless white brother under, uh, under the bus. And we actually got to flush out the whole thing and talk about internalized oppression and the, uh, and the prospect for the human future beyond um, uh, uh, racism, which I prefer to uh, called white supremacy because racism is often conflated with uh, prejudice as if they're the equivalent. And what I'm talking about is an institutionalized uh, system of um, uh, benefits and burdens, which ultimately um, burdens uh, the earth and is doing so to the breaking point.
Yes, thank you for that. It is very important to zoom out and see that bigger perspective, I think. And I really wanted to ask you, what has or has not changed in the last 30 years since Color of Fear was first released? How has the conversation about race and identity evolved, in your opinion? Uh, indeed, uh, uh, conversations about uh, race, about white supremacy, about uh, sex, about um, uh, patriarchy, uh, these are, and, and even about um, um, uh, unbridled, uh, conscience-free extraction economics, aka capitalism. These systems, I, I consider them um, reflections of the collective ego, and uh, why is the supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy, anthropocentrism, uh, they have changed a lot, but they have remained the same a lot too. Uh, white supremacy has changed a lot. No, it didn't end white supremacy to have a black president. No, it's not gonna end white supremacy to have a black uh, brown woman president. It's not gonna end um, uh, patriarchy uh, either. Those are like window dressing symbolic uh, shifts in, uh, in the total dynamic, although they are important. They're important shifts because it's, you know, when, if uh, uh, Kamala uh, Harris becomes the, uh, the next president of the United States, it will say in a way that words cannot convey to black and brown girls, that could be you. That could be your black job next time when you grow up, yeah. But uh, the, what we're looking at at this point is a heightening of um, a polar, polarization and, uh, and oppositional politics so that um, you know, defeating the enemy's uh, position or disputing their claims becomes an end in itself. The idea of making life better for my group and uh, asking the deep, hard, complex questions of what does that actually entail? What does that mean? That has left the table on both the right and the left, and I cannot stand it. I have very little patience right now. As a lifelong social activist, I've been at it for about 50 years, that the narrow identitarian, symbolic posturing, virtue signaling, kind of um, progressive politics is garbage. The um, uh, self-righteous, mean-spirited, uh, win-lose uh, paradigms that both the right and the left seem to be uh, lo locked in a death spiral around is not in service to the earth, it's not in service to women, uh, children, marginalized people, uh, and other living things. So. The, the biggest change is I think that the, the postmodern turn, the uh, internet turn, the virtual reality turn has got us caught up in stories and uh, disconnected from material realities and our radical and inter irreducible interdependence. And good diversity work brings us back to that. Good dream work does exactly the same thing. That's amazingly said. <laughs> It also brings me to to a kind of personal thing. I'm a white girl from Holland, Europe. So many things uh, that are in the film I thought might not uh, touch me because I'm in a, such a different culture. That was not true at all. Yeah. It was not true at all. And I think it's exactly because of what you said that it becomes so personal, so human in a way that That's it... Incredible. Yes, exactly. And and I was I was literally crying because I was so moved discovering new things. And I saw it last year. That's 30 years ago, uh, 30 years after it was made. So, yeah, I could I could see why this was an award winning documentary for sure. 20 plus years into seeing it, I made brand new discoveries. I was like, where is the white something, 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 something. Right. And I'm like, it's not there. It's not there. Where is it? Where is it? And it is there. It is right there. There's a moment where Gordon, the uh, the liberal white man, talks about, oh, I know there were times when 
uh, when I was younger and me and my friends would go down into the black areas to uh, dance and hang out at the clubs and we'd see the cops uh, uh, hassling us, but it didn't bother us because it wasn't happening to us and it wasn't happening in our area. I guess it was just a kind of a numbness and he shrugs his shoulders like, and I'm like, that's it right there. It's, it has nothing to do with me. But consuming the beauty of your culture, that has something to do with me and I paid my good money. So I get to have that and I get to have police protection from, you know, the thugs that might want to rob me at the, once I come out of the club. But otherwise, this is not my problem. That brings me to something I've been meaning to ask you. Um, one of the things I find so beautiful about the screening is that after the screening, there's going to be a discussion. And you said that you're going to look at the film as if it were dream material. Uh, all the issues that come up with uh, uh, in the color of fear when I've done workshops with probably hundreds of thousands by now. So it's, um, it's been around a very, very, very long time. Um, and we were on the Oprah Winfrey show and reruns and syndication twice. So that's at least 40 million people have seen uh, at least half of the film. And um, give me a question again. I completely What expected. happens? What happens when you approach a film oh, like yeah, this yeah, yeah. as um, dream material? They, uh, well, what I do, uh, um, uh, there's a there's a screening instruction. Treat just just like in a in just all dream work, you might treat every element, every figure, every creature, every human, and every spirit in the uh, dream as an element of yourself. Treat every voice in the um, film as if they were speaking your own heart. And so that's the exercise that we invite people to try on. It's like, no, 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 I'm this black guy. No, 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 I'm this Chinese guy. No, 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 I'm this Japanese guy. It's all men, incidentally. And there's a there's a downside and a very powerful upside to that. Uh, and the, or or I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm this black guy, I'm this white, you know. And some, every single person finds some people spontaneously easy to identify with it. They can't even help them. They're like, that's my story. And then other people, they're like, how could you? You know, they're like, what are you doing? <laughs> and um, but we're saying, try to include all of those perspectives, all of those points of view, all of those hearts and minds, all of those uh, intentions and histories as if they were your own. And then we talk about uh, who'd you identify with? Who'd you have trouble identifying with? Why do you think it was like that? Uh, did you identify with anybody and some, and again, shadow work? Did you identify with somebody but wished that you hadn't? <laughs> did you see yourself somewhere and go, ew, is that me? <laughs> so we do that. But then, but the purpose is always uh, in the surface of health and wholeness, individual health, individual wholeness, um, community health, community wholeness, national and global species-wide health and wholeness, the wholeness of the uh, earth community. Because human, uh, for me, my, one of my big uh, beefs with uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work is the anthropocentrism. And uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, dream work has and the and the dream world has very little patience with is uh, human centeredness and uh, centeredness and uh, rational rationality. It also has very little use for uh, patriarchy or white supremacy. It is full of critiques. Uh, I love to um, uh, read uh, Robert E. Lee's Dream Journal. <laughs> I've been doing there's uh, massive critiques of white supremacy in there. I love that. I also love how you incorporate dream work as a way to heal ourselves and our culture around us at the same time, because that well, allows you to make it personal as, as a viewer and as a participant. Well, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a student of radical feminism, and uh, one of the mantras and maxims is that the personal is political. Uh, and, and, I, and I would say like the personal unconscious uh, uh, and the collective unconscious are also political. And so, so when we work with the personal unconscious, the collective unconscious, we're shifting 
the dynamics of our, uh, our, our social arrangements as well. That is an amazing quote. And October 19th will be the screening. Just to remind everybody, we will be sharing all the information. Yay. There it is. <laughs>